All right, well, today we are beginning a new sermon series. We finished up uh, The Promised Land Life last week, and and we're going to be beginning a series on probably one of my most favorite Bible characters of all the disciples. It's the one that I like the most, the one that I feel I can relate to in a lot of ways, and that is Peter. And Peter is, to me, a fascinating study. And one of the things that has always made it of interest to me is from the time I was old enough to remember what we were discussing in Sabbath school classes and hearing in sermons, there was always this aspect of Peter and his conversion. And if you've read any of the Spirit of Prophecy books, Ellen White books and so forth, uh, at times we have made a lot of the fact that Peter wasn't converted till after the cross experience. And that always bothered me because I thought, what in the world do you do with Peter's life up until the cross? because I kind of thought Peter was walking and following Jesus and and doing as well as anybody else would have been given the circumstances. And so what do you do with that? And, and part of the big problem we have is in what conversion is. When Jesus told Peter and Luke that when you are converted, I'm going to use you to encourage your brothers, the word converted there is far different than what we consider conversion today. If I was to say someone was converted today in the way that we look at that word, it would be maybe someone who was an atheist converted to Christianity. Now that's a pretty extreme change, isn't it? And one that might have something to do with their salvation. And over the years, it's almost like we've said at times that Peter wasn't saved until he came to this experience after the cross. And I would just tell you that is not at all biblical because you see the word conversion in the Bible simply means to turn back. And Jesus was simply telling Peter, you know what, there's going to be a time when you are going to need to turn back to me. Have you ever had one of those moments in your life? You know, we've all stumbled, we all go the wrong direction at times, but it doesn't mean we give away our love for Jesus or our salvation. And part of the thing that always bothered me in my heart is I look at that story of Peter denying Jesus three times and it breaks your heart because of what you know he was going through. We know we focus on Jesus, look down and saw Peter and, you know, we think of the hurt that was in Jesus' heart. But I think, you know what? I don't think there was a, there was maybe hurt there, but not like we imagine it because Jesus already knew what? He already knew it was going to happen. He told Peter it was going to happen. The real pain and the real hurt I see is in what Peter does after he denies Jesus those three times. And he runs out of that court weeping. His heart is literally broken because he knows he has just hurt the one he probably loves more than anyone else in the whole world. And that kind of love, to me, doesn't seem to be a heart that needs to be converted to the extreme that it's not saved. And so Peter has always been one that I have been fascinated to look at and study and and so I'm going to share some of the things that I have learned from scripture not that I have learned that God has shown me because that's where it comes from this is God's word isn't it and so today as we begin I would ask you to bow your heads with me as we start with prayer father we thank you for your love for us we thank you uh, for your grace and your mercy that you extend to each of us and And God, today we just would pray for your presence that is here with us to guide and lead us as we open your word. God, help us to see Jesus in a better way because of our time here today. And we pray these things in his name. Amen. Okay, bulletin quiz number two. What's the sermon title today? Okay, that's better. So more of you are reading the sermon title than the announcements, and and that's not a bad thing, okay? But something to do with a new name. So we're going to be talking about new names today, and to get us started, I'm going to see how we do with people who have gotten a new name over the course of their life, some rather famous people. Now, before we begin, I have to tell you that in Whitehall, they got the first three of these five right, okay? So there is a little bit of pressure on you. Uh, especially after we get done with the first two. I didn't tell them I'll be reporting back how they did it, you know, compared to you guys, but uh, I might. So the first one, and ladies, I will apologize uh, from the start. There wasn't 
very many famous ladies that we might know of that have had their names changed. It was mostly men, so I squeezed one woman, one woman in between the sets of two men on either side, and it happens to be the one I think people might struggle with the most. So, just the way it is. So the first one, um, this man was born as Cassius Clay. Now this one's easy. I would hope everyone kind of gets this one. Muhammad Ali, okay? Number two, Marion Robert Morrison was his given name at birth. John Wayne. Now can you imagine if the Duke had kept his original name and went by Marion? It just kind of takes away from the picture you have of John Wayne, right? A boy named Sue? I didn't know John Wayne sang a song like that, so I'm learning as we go. All right, number two, or number three, and this is the woman, just in case you're wondering. Uh, Frances Ethel Gum was the name she was given at birth. Judy Garland, very good. So you guys are tied with them, three for three. So this is where everything went haywire in Whitehall. Okay? And this one really shouldn't be that hard. William Jefferson Blythe. William Jefferson Blythe was this man's name at birth. Uh Uh-oh. I had such high expectations. (laughs) William Jefferson Blythe. I see some are getting their smartphones out. That's the thing about where we live today. Things like this can really fail fast because in two seconds you can have the answer. He happened to be a president of the United States for the person who was asking for a clue. We know him better as Bill Clinton. Hope raised her hand and says, I did know that. And he knew that. See, some of you are, you know, we've talked about this condition before. Some of us are afraid to answer because we might be what? We might be wrong, and if we're wrong, somebody might think that we were wrong. You know what I've learned over the course of my life is that, you know, there's no sense hiding it. It's just the fact. I'm wrong occasionally. All right, last one. Um, Leslie Lynch King Jr. Now, you have already got a big hint because I told you we only had one woman in these five names. So when you hear Leslie, don't let that fool you. Leslie Lynch King Jr. Now you see, I baited you. I said, don't be afraid to answer because it's not bad to be wrong. And everybody's going to think Martin Luther King Jr. And you're all wrong. So that's what you get for answering. (laughs) Actually, he was another president by the name of Gerald Ford. Now that's a pretty drastic change, isn't it? Leslie Lynch King Jr. I bet he was glad that his parents let him change his name if they did. So, people that have changed their names. Peter, the one that we're talking about, also experienced a name change. He was born as Simon Bar-Jonah or Simon son of John. That's what Bar-Jonah means. And so he was Simon by birth, and that's how he was known. That is who he was until one day when his brother Andrew took him to meet Jesus. In your Bibles, look with me to John chapter 1, and we want to look at verses 41 and 42. John chapter 1, verses 41 and 42, page 1050, if you happen to be following along in your pew Bible. John chapter 1. And verses 41 and 42. It says here, Andrew, Simon Peter's brother, was one of the two who had heard what John had said and who had followed Jesus. The other one of the two was most likely John the disciple who is writing this gospel. Verse 41, the first thing that Andrew did was to go and find who? Simon, his brother, and tell him, we have found the Messiah, the Christ. And so verse 42, he brings him to Jesus, 
And imagine meeting anyone for the very first time. This is the first time you've spoke to them. These are the first words that we have recorded in Scripture that Jesus spoke to Peter. And this is how the encounter went. Jesus simply looked at him and said, You are Simon, son of John, but now you are called what? Cephas, or we would say Peter, translated Peter. And if you have the King James Version there, it will say that is translated as stone. That's quite an introduction. You meet somebody for the first time and that's what they do. Hey, your name's Simon, but guess what? Now you're Peter. Now you're stone. And it's important to understand the definition of the word rock or stone here in Peter's name because it simply means a piece of a rock, one that has been taken off of a bigger rock, okay? And so that's Peter's name. But the question that we might ask today is why in the world would this be the way Jesus introduces himself to Peter? These are his first words he speaks to Peter, and it's just about, you know what, you were used to be Simon, but now you're Peter. Why would he change his name like that? Well, we have one more famous name change that I want to take you through to get us pointed in the right direction. We'll see if anybody knows who this is. And this is a woman, by the way. Isabella Bomfrey. Anybody know who that is? And it's not a man, okay? So, I'm not tricking you. Isabella Bomfrey was born into slavery in 1797. In between her birth and when she finally gained freedom in the 1800s, she was sold to four other slave owners. In 1843, Isabella Bomfrey changed her own name. And Hope's raising her hand, and so she's going to give us the right answer. Sojourner Truth, that's exactly right. Our school must be teaching these kids awesome things because we're getting a lot of answers from that row. She wins the prize. She gets to eat dessert at potluck before she goes through the main line, all right? I don't care what her mom says. Sojourner Truth, that became her new name. And with it became, came a change in what she did. She then became an itinerant preacher who went out and fought for the cause of human rights. And this is what one historian writes of her. It says here that Sojourner Truth was perhaps the most famous African-American woman in the 19th century America. For over 40 years, she traveled the country as a forceful and passionate advocate for the dispossessed, using her quick wit and fearless tongue to fight for human rights. Now, the interesting thing about it is because of where she was born and the time that she was in slavery, she never, ever in her entire life learned to read or to write. One of the most famous people when it comes to slavery and fighting for the rights of the oppressed, and by the way, along the way, preaching the good news of Jesus Christ, never, ever learned to read or write. Now, for her, her change of name represented what in her life? Represented a freedom that she had gained for sure, but it represented a new direction that she was taking in her life. And in that new direction, she became something that would be amazing to everyone around her simply because they knew who she was before. Her name change literally meant that she was a different person than anyone had ever known, an illiterate slave that couldn't read or write to a woman who was going around with passion and with clarity, speaking out for the rights of the oppressed. Could it be that Jesus, in that first encounter with Peter, as he looked at Peter and he said, Simon used to be your name, but now you are going to be Peter, could it be that Jesus was telling Peter that there is something different 
I have in mind for you. You are going to be because of who I am in your life. You are going to be a different person than who you are today. Again, look with me in your Bibles to Luke chapter 5. And we want to read verses 8 through 11. Luke chapter 5 and verses 8 through 11. Page 1019, if you're following along in your pew Bible again. Uh, Luke chapter 5, verses 8 through 11. Uh, we're not going to read the whole story. Here is the setting, and I think most of us have heard this story. Uh, we remember that Jesus came and preached from the Peter's boat there, and then after he was done sharing with the crowd, he has them push off shore. And Peter and his other fishermen friends had been fishing all night long, and they hadn't caught a single thing. Okay? And now Jesus tells them to do what? Throw the nets over. And they trust in Jesus even though they know it's not the right time of day to fish and they've been fishing all night and haven't caught anything. They trust in Jesus enough to throw the nets over. And what happens next is one of the greatest fishing stories that's ever been told. But the only difference is, is this one's actually true. Okay? If Joel starts telling you a fishing story, well, just kind of hang on because you don't know how far it may go. He has stories of catching 30-some-inch brown trout. But that's true, so I guess I have to, to say he's a good fisherman. But this story is the nets are so full they begin to break. They put them in the boats. The boats begin to sink. Peter realizes that, and we pick it up here in verse 8. When Peter saw this, Simon Peter saw this, he fell at Jesus' knees and said, Go away from me, Lord, I am a what? Sinful man. He saw Jesus for who Jesus was, didn't he? He knew who Jesus was. And when we know who Jesus is, there's someone else we get to know very quickly. And who's that? Ourselves. In the presence of a righteous and glorious Savior, Peter understood exactly who he was. And the words that he says to Jesus here, Go away from me, for I am a what? Sinful man. I am not worthy to even be in your what? Your presence. Go away from me. But here's where the story gets neat. For he and all of his companions, verse 9, were ast astonished at the catch of fish they had taken. And verse 10, so were James and John, the sons of Zebedee, Simon's partners. Then Jesus said to Simon, don't be afraid. In other words, don't worry about how you feel so unworthy because I have that what? I have that covered because my grace is sufficient for sinners such as you and every one that will come before me. From now on, you will catch men. And so they pulled up their boats on shore and left everything and followed him. I like this story because in one moment, Peter is saying, away from me, Jesus, because I'm a what? I'm a sinner. And the very next moment, he is leaving everything that he is known behind and is what? He's following Jesus. That's what Jesus does for us when we recognize who he is. The old devil may make us feel like we should be away from Jesus, but guess what Jesus says? No, don't go away. That's the last thing you need to do when you understand who you are. What you need more than anything else is to come and be with me. Come and follow me. And so that's exactly what Peter does. He leaves everything behind. We think of that name change. Simon was born a fisherman, but Peter was now going to be a fisher of men. Simon felt like one who didn't belong with Jesus because of who he was. Peter was a follower of Jesus. But as you stop in and think about this for a moment, obviously Jesus is calling Peter to a different life than he's known. But why does he single out Peter? If it's all really about Peter's going to be living some kind of a different life, that he's been called to leave behind fishing and come be a fisher of men, 
why isn't it that Jesus is going to all the disciples and saying, you know what, you used to be John, but now you're somebody else. You used to be Andrew, but now you're somebody else. Why is it he only changes the name of Peter? Is there something else to this story besides just Peter becoming something different in Jesus? I want us to turn to the other place in Scripture where Jesus reminds Peter of this name change. Matthew chapter 16 and verses 15 through 18. Matthew chapter 16, verses 15 through 18, page 973. A couple books before Luke here. Matthew chapter 16 and verses 15 through 18. Jesus has been talking to the disciples about who those around them, who he's been preaching to, say that he is. And now 15, he comes to the disciples in specific. But what about you, he says to the disciples? Who do you say that I am? Verse 16, Simon Peter answered, you are who? You are the Christ the Son of the living God. Did Peter know who Jesus was in his heart? He did, didn't he? And then notice Jesus' reply. Jesus, Jesus said, Blessed are you who? Simon, son of Jonah. See, he goes back to Peter's what? His old name, who he was before. And he says, Blessed are you, Simon, son of Jonah, for this was not revealed to you by man, but by from my Father in heaven. And I tell you that you are who? Here's the name change. You were Simon, son of Jonah. Now you are blessed and you are Peter. And on this rock, I will build my church and the gate of Hades will not overcome it. So, over the years, we have struggled with this verse just a little bit, haven't we? Because the last thing we want to do is take out of this verse that Peter is somehow the rock that Christ is going to build his church on. The reason that we are afraid of that is because there are some in the Christian world today who have taken this text and said that Peter is some infallible person who ultimately was the very first pope. And that makes us very leery of this verse because we don't want to be anywhere close to that Catholic stuff, right? So much so that we have missed what Jesus is saying to Peter. Now again, it's important to understand the definition of Peter. Again, we mentioned it earlier as a stone or a rock. He is a piece of a rock. The rock that Jesus says, the rock that we're going to build the church on, is a different word. That rock means a mass of rock, one that is immovable. If Jesus is going to build his church on something, is it going to be better if he builds it on a piece of a rock or a mass of a rock that's immovable. He's going to build it on the mass. As a matter of fact, he's told us because he says a wise man will build his house on the rock, an immovable rock. And so who clearly is being mentioned here as the one that the church is going to be built on? It's going to be on Jesus Christ. He is the foundation. If we have any doubt in our minds about this, Peter himself solves the dilemma. In 1 Peter chapter 2, we're not going to read it today, but where Peter is telling us in 1 Peter 2 about living stones being built together <clears throat> into a holy priesthood, a church, it says that that church is built on Jesus Christ himself, the chief what? Chief cornerstone. And so Peter himself is saying, you know, who the church is built on is Jesus Christ. But what is Jesus doing back in Matthew? When he says, blessed are you, Peter, who used to be who? Simon, son of Jonah. Simon bar Jonah. What is he saying to Peter now? Have you ever heard the expression, a chip off the old block? 
that typically means if you're talking about a dad and a son, that if the son is a chip off the old block, that there is something in the son that reminds people of who? The father. My dad's here, and it would be one of the highest compliments that I could have for somebody to say, a chip off the old block. But stop and think about it. Peter is a piece of what? A piece of the rock. Ultimately, something that is to remind us of what? Of the immovable rock. Unless we miss what Jesus is really saying here because we're afraid of where some people have taken it, we don't want to forget what Jesus is saying. Because he's telling us that, Peter, you are part of the foundation of the church that I am going to build, a church that is going to last for how long? Forever. Don't miss that. Because Jesus is telling Peter something. You used to be this, but now you are part of the foundation that I am going to build my church on. I am the chief cornerstone but you are a piece of that very rock that I am going to build the church on. If you're saying, Pastor, that doesn't sound quite right, turn with me back to, and keep your finger in Matthew, by the way, because we're going to come right back to it here. But go with me to Ephesians chapter 2, where we fall, find Paul re- writing us here, Paul writing. We'll be doing the reading, Ephesians chapter 2, and we want to look at verses 19 and 20. Paul here is writing to the church in Ephesus very much along the same lines as Peter's letter where he said the church is built on Jesus Christ himself, the chief cornerstone. Page 1157, Ephesians chapter 2, and we want to look at verses 19 and 20. It says, Consequently, you are no longer foreigners and aliens, but fellow citizens with God's people and members of God's household. Built on what? Pay attention here. It says, built on the foundation of the apostles and the prophets with Christ Jesus himself being the what? Chief cornerstone. Do you understand what it's telling us about the foundation of the very church to which we belong today? That foundation is made up of the apostles, the disciples, and the prophets Don't let anybody tell you we don't need the Old Testament. We're just a New Testament church because Jesus makes it very clear. God makes it very clear that the church is built on the apostles and the prophets with Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone. Paul makes that clear. Who's the real foundation that we're building on? It's Jesus. But on that foundation, part of the foundation that is of this church, of all of the believers in Christ Jesus today, is the apostles, including who himself? Peter. And Jesus is recognizing Peter as such back in Matthew. He is saying, blessed are you. You used to be Simon. You used to be just a fisherman. But now you're a fisher of men. You used to be someone who would spend his day on the lake, but now you are a part of the foundation of my what? My church. But again, we have to come back to this question because it says apostles. It doesn't just say Peter. Why does Jesus keep singling out Peter in this name change? What is he trying to tell us here? Well, let's go back to Matthew and we're going to look at chapter 10 now in verses 1 and 2. As you're turning there, Matthew 10, verses 1 and 2, page 964, if you happen to lose Matthew there. But as we're getting there, there are four places in Scripture where we have the disciples listed. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and the book of Acts. In all four of those places, guess who is listed first among the twelve? Or eleven if you get to Acts, because by that time we were minus one, right? Peter is listed first. And I want us to notice what happens here in chapter 10 of Matthew, verses 1 and 2. He called his twelve disciples to him and gave them authority to drive out every evil to drive out evil spirits and to heal every disease and sickness these are the names of the 12 apostles and it says first who simon or peter 
Now, if you have a King James Version, my Bible left out a word there. My Bible just says these are the names of the twelve apostles first, Simon. If you have a King James, there's a little three-letter word there. It says the first, Simon. And the word first there, we have to understand, is very important. It just doesn't mean that Peter happened to be the first one Jesus put on the list. The Greek there is protus. And it doesn't mean first on the list. It literally means first in rank. The leader or the chief of a group or an assembly. So what is Jesus telling us about Peter? Of the twelve pieces of the rock that are going to be part of the foundation of the church, Peter is in rank at the top of the list. He's number one. Now, before we get carried away here, what does Jesus teach us about rank? The first shall be what? Last, and the last shall be first. So Jesus isn't in it about who gets to be at the top. He's not telling us that Peter's better than somebody else, or he's ranked there for prestige or honor. He's simply telling us that this is what he has appointed Peter to be, is the leader, the chief of this assembly or this group. And do we see Peter taking that role over the course of his life? We do, don't we? He is usually the one who is the spokesman for the twelve. He is usually the one who is willing to act first, sometimes before thinking, but he's usually first to act, right? And he is the spokesman often, and probably most notably when we get past Jesus' death and resurrection when Pentecost takes place. Holy Spirit came out on all of the followers, did it not? It did. But when that happened, who is it that we find preaching that powerful sermon in Acts? It is Peter, isn't it? And to me, as I study this, there is a reason Peter is the one whose name is being changed. There is a reason Jesus is putting him as number one in rank. Because Peter represents all of the apostles, all of the followers of Jesus. Peter represents what Jesus is wanting to do in all of his disciples' lives and all of his followers' life, his lives, including us today. We may not be all called to leave behind our jobs and everything and go and be a preacher or whatever, but Jesus is calling us all to be followers and disciples, is he not? And he's laying out before us one that serves as an example, one that he has called to be the leader, part of the foundation of his church. And perhaps the place where we find that best exemplified is after the time of Pentecost, and we read about it in Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. Page 1080, Acts chapter 4 and verse 13. We, again, giving us the background of the story here, uh, Peter and John have been out preaching powerful. They come up the temple steps, and we know the lame man that is healed. Silver and gold have I none, but what I do have I will give you. In the name of Jesus Christ, stand up and what? Stand up and walk. Incredible story. The problem is, is like Jesus, when he did incredible things, it didn't impress the Jewish leaders very much. And Peter and John weren't impressing them either, so they're taken before the elders and the rulers here in verse 13, it says this, when they saw the courage of Peter and John and realized that they were unschooled and ordinary men. Again, the King James here is not very flattering at all because it says unlearned and ignorant. Is that how you want to be called? Oh yeah, you're unlearned and ignorant. But remember, there was a name change, right? That's who... Simon used to be. It's not Peter anymore because it says here when they realized this, that they were unschooled ordinary men, it says they were astonished. In other words, they were blown away at who Peter had become. 
because of his walk with Jesus, something had happened with Peter. He wasn't the unschooled fisherman, Simon of old as he was born. He was now someone new in Peter, and it blew the rulers and the elders away. And that's impressive in and of itself. But we have to finish the verse because if you don't get anything else out of our time here today, understand and get this part. The end of verse 13, it says they were astonished and they took note that these men had been where? With Jesus. I would ask you today, is there anything in this whole world that could be better said of any one of us than that? That when somebody looks at you, they take note and they say, you know what? That person has been with who? Jesus. And if we really understand what the language is saying there, that person reminds me of who? Jesus. That person is a chip off the old block. That's a piece of the rock. That's noteworthy. They have been with Jesus. Matthew Henry's commentary says this, that they have been with Jesus, speaking of Peter and John, but we can focus in on Peter here. And this makes them so holy and heavenly and spiritual and cheerful. This has raised them so much above this world and filled them with another. In other words, because they have been with Jesus, it takes them to another place, doesn't it? They're not of this world any longer. It's not Simon of the world. It's now Peter who is in another world because he has been with who? He's been with Jesus. And that's how he is recognized. This man, these men, Peter and John, have been with Jesus. What is your name? today? Have you ever stopped and thought about what people see in you? Proverbs 22.1, one of the wisest men who has ever lived, Solomon said that a good name is better than the greatest riches of the world. Ecclesiastes 7 and verse 1 that same Solomon said that a good name is of the highest value, so much so that your day of death with a good name is better than the day that you were what? That you were born. His point is simply this, when you're born, who you're born as, really it hasn't been determined yet. But when you die, that has all been figured out, hasn't it? It's a man by the name of pastor and writer by the name of J.R. Miller from years gone by that wrote this, the only thing that walks back from the tomb with the mourners and refuses to be buried is the character of a man. The only thing that's not buried is who you are. What a man is, he goes on to, to say, survives him and can never be buried. What is your name today? If people were to look at you, would they take note and say, you know what, that person has been with Jesus? Our scripture reading today, Revelation 2 and verse 17, says, for those who overcome, I am going to give them a new name written on a white stone. We often look at those messages to the churches and the promises to the overcomer as something that we're going to get when we're in heaven. We just spent three months talking about the fact that the promised land experience isn't something that is only for when we get to heaven. It should be something we are living right now. The promise for the overcomer in all of the seven messages to the churches isn't something out there in heaven. The overcoming happens where? Do we overcome in heaven? No. We're in heaven because we overcame. And we overcome by the blood of the Lamb, Christ Jesus. 
We overcome because we have a relationship with Jesus. We overcome because Jesus has given us a new name. I was born Jim, but by God's grace and by His love and His mercy, somewhere along the way, Jesus has transformed my life and I am a new person. And by God's grace, hopefully at some moment in my life, if it's even such a sliver of time, hopefully by God's grace, someone will be able to look at me and say, you know what? That person has been with Jesus. Jesus came to Peter and said, you were Simon, but now you're Peter. I am going to make you a leader. I am going to set you above all others, not because you're better, not because it's a thing of rank, but I'm going to set you there as an example of what I will do in a person's life when they come to me. I'm going to change who you were, change who you are. And when it's all said and done, you are going to have a new name. And when people look at you, they are going to know that you have been with me because you are like me. What is your name today? My prayer is, as we end our time here together today, that God has given you, is giving you, a new name. What you once were, you are no longer that anymore because God is changing your life. And by God's grace, may it be said of every one of us today, may the world take note that we have been with Jesus.